delight is meant to be a shared reality. In the scriptures, delight is connected to this imagery of bending yourself towards something or towards someone. There's a bending in me, not just for my own gratification or my own self you know, satisfaction, but for something else. And then in that giving or in that bending, um, there's an expansion of the delight I've received. So a delight is much more, should be much more than just a personal experience. It's one, it's an experience that's meant to be multiplied. You're listening to the Rule of Life podcast by Practicing the Way. In each season, we explore an ancient practice from the way of Jesus and its relevance for the modern era. This is season one, Sabbath. Episode three. Now we are to the good part. To recap, we broke down the Sabbath into four movements based on four translations or interpretations of the Hebrew verb Shabbat or Sabbath. They are stop, stop, Brian, rest, delight, and worship. worship. Yeah, that was not even planned <laughs> wow. right there. I feel like some kind of 90s church. That was off the cuff, so people. <laughs> yes. If you have made it this far, it's about to get good because next up is delight. We wanted, when the three of us were crafting the Sabbath practice uh, for Practicing the Way, we wanted to start with delight just because it's our favorite <laughs> and oh. it's the most fun. But you kind of have to like, you know, set the foundation of stop and yeah. rest first Absolutely. before you get to delight. Because Sabbath isn't just about what we don't do, it's about what we do, do. That is not yeah, good English I right there. Do. That's nice. <laughs> I, you had to go there. <laughs> you had to My say mind it. was like, I hope people don't. And then you just- I need to name it for all who are listening. But that's kind of the dimension of the Sabbath that we want to explore. One of the original intentions for the Sabbath is an entire day set aside for delight. Now, I have lots of things to say about that, but Brian and Bethany, how does that hit you to kind of frame our conversation, you know, do you think most people imagine the Sabbath as a day of delight? Um, you know, I would say no and yes. Is that possible to say yes? That's exactly to both? right. Yeah. Because it's like, yes, I think in theory we all have this ideal version of like Sabbath. Right. And it's gonna be dreamy and like fireflies and yes. perfectly chilled and wine. And the Garden of Eden. Right. And yes. And, and chilled how, wine. Yeah, how it's supposed to be. <laughs> Um, and at the same time, I think when you actually start leaning into it, as we've been talking about, it's yeah. a, an entire day alone feels like a lot. You know, it feels like, yeah, that's a great idea in theory, but time is money. Yes. Or, you know, like, I don't know if I have enough time or yeah. whatever the complications are. So I think. Um, but do you talk to anybody who's like, if, if, you know, whose experience of, of Sabbath or what it conjures in their memory or imagination is kind of just like a day of religious observance. And yes. kind of like lots of, that's the, and like you, the very few people I know that grew up in circles of the Western church where Sabbath was mandated, for them it was like, well, Sabbath was the day I wasn't allowed to right. exactly. play hockey on Sunday. I wasn't yeah. allowed to it's a go limitation to the mall of with the my fun friends. Things. Yeah, it's like yeah. that was yeah. the day I couldn't do the fun yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, that I absolutely. We talked last episode about resistances, and I think that hits at the heart of it. Is you paint a picture of Sabbath. Sometimes when I hear you talk about Sabbath, John Mark, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, especially when different <laughs> seasons of life with kids, and 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 it 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 taps into this deep longing that I know my soul and my body has mm -hmm. for a place to to come into that. You know, we're still we still are figuring out. Every new season has new challenges, and I think. When you think about r r the world that we live in, that's so hurried, it's so, um, all the things we talked about, there's so many resistances, all the things that are painfully true in our own bodies week to week. It's pretty easy to sketch a picture of how beautiful it could be. So people, yes. that's the yes and no that you're talking about. It's it like the idyllic like, image. Oh my and gosh, And there's yes. the messy reality. And then you realize, oh, I have to prepare and plan and right. I have to not respond to these people and I have to do all this work beforehand and I and have emotions to, will come up right, when I, I do that myself, that I've been running yeah. away from Which, yes her, that wasn't in the ideal image yeah. you know and we think delight is a state of bliss and ecstasy and really mm -hmm. delight mm -hmm. as we talked about last time it moves into through resistance into yes. something deeper and so it's actually not 
a lack of tension, it's moving through into a deeper place where the yeah. real thing can be It's engagement oh, with what is, amazing. not disengagement. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's so that's a, a I, I do agree. I think, I think it is a both end. Yeah. So in light of that, why don't you give us a recap of the session three of Sabbath Delight? Yeah. Session three is Delight. I open by kind of talking about how sorrow is inevitable in life, but joy is not. Hmm. Just meaning, you know, Jesus had the famous line, in this world, you will face trouble. Sorrow will come into your life and to mine with or without our permission hmm. or any kind of discipline or rule of life or, you know, set schedule. But joy, we have to choose hmm. and we have to keep choosing it. And then I do a very short biblical theology of joy, which I like to do through a Venn diagram if for those of you listening, you can imagine a Venn diagram, three overlapping circles in your mind. First, joy is a feeling. So like I grew up hearing uh, this common kind of refrain in preaching that happiness and joy are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the world offers you happiness, but happiness is based on your circumstances or happenstance, but joy is based on God. And, and that's actually not true. So, you know, Randy Alcorn has that book on happiness, mm -hmm. like biblical theology of happiness, and it's, it's hundreds of pages long. Yeah. And I just remember reading his chapter where he he takes that you know claim head on, basically argues that joy and happiness, those two words are used interchangeably in the entirety of the library of scripture. Yeah. And what's true about that is for a follower of Jesus, there is a kind of joy that transcends our circumstances mm -hmm. because yeah. this life is not all there is yeah. and because we're living in communion with God. But it's not true that there isn't a legitimate form of joy that God has intended for your life and mine that is based on your feelings. It's just joy is the feeling of when life is as it should be, when when you are living how God wants you to yeah. live. And, mm -hmm. you know, and when the world around you is how God wants it to be, mm -hmm. the yeah. natural feeling in your body to that is joy. Yeah. You know, that's that's why arguably. God feels joy and sadness, but God is joyful by nature. God is not sad by nature. Mm. Sadness is his response to evil. Mm. And the same, I think, for us, when we are living as God intended, we have a feeling of joy. Mm. Secondly, joy is also a condition, or you know, better language there maybe is a character trait. Joy is not just a feeling in our body, it is the kind of people we become. You know, So in Paul's list of the fruit of the spirit, the first one is love, and the second one is joy. And mm. a number of scholars think that there's actually an order of importance there. You know, we yeah. don't know, but love is the ultimate priority and then joy. And of course, those two things go together because really morose people tend to not be the most <laughs> loving people, you know, and most yeah. loving people yeah. are very joyful. Point being, in a biblical theology, the fruit of the spirit, again, these are not just feelings. These are, I think Willard called them inner dispositions of the heart. They are the kinds of people we are formed into yeah. in our inner woman or inner man through apprenticeship to Jesus as we create space for the spirit of God to terraform and transform us from the inside out. We become people who are loving, who are mm. joyful, who are mm. peaceful, who are patient, yeah. who are kind. So joy is a character trait. It is the kind of people we become. The hope is that with each passing year in our discipleship to Jesus, we become more and more joyful mm -hmm by character, not by kind of just the circumstances of our life. And then finally, joy is a discipline. You know, there are times when joy is easy. Again, when it's just the first day of spring in Portland, Oregon, you know, that Hello. first day where you're like in oh. a t-shirt and you're outside <laughs> and there's hope for the future of humanity. Or I remember the day that my first child was born or, you know, whatever it is, there are times when it's just it's just the natural response to what is. There are other times when joy is a sheer act of obedience mm -hmm. to Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. It is a discipline that you have to choose to index your heart toward the good. Mm -hmm. Richard Foster called this the discipline of celebration. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't think of a party as a discipline, you know, or joy. Willard called it the discipline of joy. Yeah. And again, that's pretty far out of a lot of our paradigms, you know. But Foster said, the decision to set the mind on the higher things of life is an act of the will. Mm. That is why celebration is a discipline. It is not something that falls on our heads. It is the result of a consciously chosen way of thinking mm. and living. Of course, this is Paul, Paul's word, rejoice, you know, which is masked in the English translation, but in Greek, joy is a noun and a verb. So, but in English it's translated, the verb is translated rejoice. But to rejoice is to joy. It mm. is to choose with your will 
to joy. So that's the Venn diagram, feeling, condition, discipline. Sabbath is a discipline of celebration, like it's in that category. And as a result, it is a delivery mechanism for joy. And I think it is one of the most important disciplines by which we become people who are Mm. joyful or full of joy, like God is full of joy. Then in the session, I talk about Genesis 2, and again, that phrase that God rested on the seventh day, and how in context, the picture is not of God as burned out and like worn down from a really long week of like, Mm -hmm. I made the world. (laughs) But it's more like that feeling like when you get done with a massive project at work, or if you're a caregiver, a season in the life of your care, where you like sit back and you just celebrate what you've done and you just take delight in it. You're like, oh my gosh. To relish in it. Yeah, Yeah. I remember back in the day when we had a yard in our house and I hate yard work. I just, I'm not, some people (laughs) love it and I just hate it. And I remember, you know, sometimes I'd have to go out and do this like Portland spring, like yard cleanup day. And it was just, Bethany, you're a new homeowner. Uh, it's this happening. Is, it's I mean, you're talking your about life. it. I have yes. anxiety. <laughs> and I would hate it. But I just remember that feeling of like getting done, you know, all this work. I don't enjoy it. It's done. And then just, I remember taking a shower, sitting on mm-hmm. my back deck opening up a beer and just looking at how (laughs) awesome it all was. And that great feeling of just like, I did that and it's great. And of course, three days later, it needs to be weeded again or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in Oregon, just things will not stop growing. But it is what it is. So I think that's, I think that's the picture in Genesis too. Mm. In a sense, that's a human mirror of like, God is delight, he's resting, he's delighting in the work of his hands. And so on the Sabbath, we delight, you know, we delight in God's world. We delight in our life in God's world. We delight in God himself. I use this quote from Dan Allender in who is our recommended reading for the practice. He writes, the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. Hmm. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought, it is the best day of the week. Mm. It is the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the day we remember on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we, and listen to this picture of Sabbath, we feast, play, dance, have sex, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, walk, and watch creation in its fullness. Mm. Few people are willing to enter the Sabbath and sanctify it to make it holy because a full day of delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone in a week. Wow. So then I talk about kind of various ways that we practice Sabbath delight Mm. And then I end by talking about how the Sabbath is the only spiritual discipline that is scheduled by God, not by your felt need or by your community. Mm. So like, you know, prayer, for example, we tend to pray on demand, like, oh, I feel like I need to take a minute and go pray. Mm. Yeah. Or scripture, often like, I feel like I need to read scripture and I'm going to do it in this time slot or whatever. Or church is set by our church, like at my church gathers at 10 a.m. on Sunday or whatever. Mm-hmm. But Sabbath is one that's not set by us. It's built into the fabric of creation. Mm. And the power of that is that Sabbath comes every seven days, Yeah, every seven days, whether you are ready for it or not, whether you want it or not, at the end of a week of bliss mm-hmm. and at the end of a horrible week when, when, in winter and in summer to remind us and to teach us to delight in God Mm. in all of the seasons of our lives. Mm. The Sabbath practice is a four week experience designed to be run in your church, small group or community that combines teaching, conversation and spiritual exercises to introduce you to this ancient discipline for life with God. If you come on the Sabbath practice, you will not just learn about the Sabbath, you will practice the Sabbath. The end goal is to integrate Sabbath into your rule of life in order to arrange your life around God. This offering is completely free thanks to the generosity of The Circle, a group of people from all over the world who give monthly to Practicing the Way. Available now at practicingtheway.org. With the rest of our time, now I wanna kick it back to you two Mm. and open up a conversation just with, we have a handful of follow-up thoughts 
to explore this idea of delight, you know, which yeah. again is a great and fun idea, but is at the same time new for a lot of us. Thought one is just that God is joyful. Hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is the most understated, um, I think the most understated one we have here yeah. at this point, because I think a lot of times, you know, I mean, this is our foundational truth. This is actually where we start when we start talking about delight in general. But we don't often say it or think about God. I think a lot of people don't actually have this vision of or God. Or believe that he's that he's actually joyful, yes. you know, and that he's a person. Um, but this is the place we start, is that God is joyful. This is like the base mm. camp of all that we're going to even explore further. And I think the idea here is that God is a person that we get to enjoy, yeah. Yeah. that we get to be with on the Sabbath. And even even just embracing that basic truth, I think, shapes how we come into Sabbath and then what we can expect in that space of Sabbath. You know, if we're going to spend a day with God mm. and God is joyful, then that's going to be a happy day. That's going to be a good day, one that's filled, to your point, with joy. Um, it's like spending time with someone you love and actually enjoy, like even you two. Like, I'm enjoying this because yeah. I actually love you. I'm enjoying too. you as yeah. well oh. right now. <laughs> But you get joy when you're spending time with the person that yes. you love. And I think we forget a lot of and times. And somebody who's joyful. Like it's one of the reasons I love being totally. around you and like other people. Because you're, I mean, you're not all, I know you. Yeah. Like you're not always <laughs> joyful. But your baseline, yes. I think, is joy. Yeah. Know? And I think that is what we get to expect when we come into Sabbath. God is a joyful God. Yeah. And that means that our experience of him at the base level is joy. Okay. I know some people are like, the Apostle Paul, then Karl Barth. I'm not that person. <laughs> But there is a Karl Barth quote I love that I have to read right now. He has some great thoughts on the Trinity. And really, in my mind, everything comes back to Trinitarian theology yeah. mm -hmm. and the nature of who God mm -hmm. is. And he writes, God's triune being is radiant, yeah. and what he radiates is joy. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Not yes. justice, righteousness, yeah. anger, wrath, fear, yeah. joy. It's loving, it being the Trinity's loving intermingling of persons as if in a cosmic dance yeah. radiate beauty. Mm. Mm. So this image of like delight within the Trinity itself, the Father delighting yeah. in the Son, the Son delighting in the Spirit, the Spirit delighting in the Father, just that sense of just enjoyment of one yeah. another as person is at the heart of God himself. You know, I remember this conversation with my daughter, Evie, who this was in the last year. So she was either seven or eight and she woke up one morning and I don't know what, if we had been reading Genesis or some, you know, like story Bible before and it was in her head, but she woke up and she said to me, she said, dad, I think I know why God created humans. And I said, oh, that's amazing. Tell me why. And she, I think God was lonely. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, like theologically, no, I like, that's but I like theology. the heart. But here's the thing, what I said was, I actually told him, I said, do you remember that God is actually, God is relationship. He's in love with the spirit and he's in love with his son and they just get to enjoy one another. And I'm just like kind of describing this like, conversation as you know yeah, Eras trinitarian theology you know erasmus he 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 when he quotes or when he um does a translation for 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 john one he says in the beginning was the conversation wow which i love that so much yeah. but i was explaining what this joyful celebration of being was and she just looked at me and said oh yeah you know i bet that was so fun <laughs> <laughs> and i just love our picture of god is so Puny. It's I so know. small. Yeah, one dimensional. And it's not it's not joyful. It's not joyful. It's and the last thing. Willard, you know, he says God is the most joyful being, being in, the, in universe. the universe. It's such a great, like, oh, what a gift to hear him say that. And one of the things talking about relishing and cherishing, I think people get afraid when they come into a Sabbath. And even as we're talking, well, I don't even know how to enjoy God or I don't know how to be with him because my my prayer life is so weak or it's so small or like I don't know how to do it. And and you know, this is a, a journey. It's not like you don't walk into deep relationship easily. It mm -hmm. takes time and it takes work. And I was reflecting on how many couples that I've walked with, and you can almost tell that when the majority of their conversation tends to be about their relationship, mm. that it's not going well. 
And so sometimes like what my wife and I will do is on a date night, we'll just like forget our problems, forget whatever weight we're living under, and we'll kind of put it all in a box and go out. We're not going to talk about the kids or school or any, we're going to go enjoy something together. And the act of enjoying something together creates joy between us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's like my, my kind of like language for like, I want to enjoy poetry on, on Sabbath together. And I want... God to be sitting here with me and enjoying it. And yeah. I know it sounds mystical. Or a Sabbath for meal son. does that. A you Sabbath know? meal is that way. And and it's partly you enjoy being with God, but you also enjoy with God the thing that you're looking upon. Yeah. And that's yeah. the relishing. And for me, that's been a big shift in the way that I've viewed. Yes. Okay, this isn't just a 24 hour devotional. Yes. This is a 24 hour like enjoyment together of other things. And I've. But you know, it's, it's tied together. And, you know, Tozer famously said, you know, what, 70 years ago now that what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important mm. thing about you yes. because we become like our vision of God for better or yes. for worse. And a lot of people feel guilt over the fact that, hey, a whole day, yeah. we'll talk about this in the next episode, Sabbath as a day of worship, a whole day like devoted to God, like they feel guilt because that doesn't sound fun to them yeah. at all. Yeah, And a, a Guilt is not the most helpful emotion there. I think for a lot of people, for a lot of us, it's because they've yet to realize how joyful God is. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if it's really hard to want to be with somebody that you think is mad at you or scary or cold or aloof, like yeah. and if people's primary emotion of God is fear, yeah. you know, in particular in certain church traditions, God is so he hates you so much that he had to kill his son so he doesn't have to kill you, which yeah. is not actually what Reformation thought scholars would say, but that is how it comes yeah. across to a lot of mm. people. It's really hard to want to be with somebody yeah. like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. not exactly the Trinitarian picture of God and Jesus with God as father who's running after the prodigal yeah. and who's coaxing the prodigal elder son into the party, you know, come to the party with me. Mm. That's a very different picture of God yeah. than it's a good thing I killed my son rather than you, you yeah. know? And again, I'm not trying to disparage a particular view of the atonement. There's there's truth embedded in those aspects. God does take sin very seriously, but it is out of his great love and delight in his sons and his daughters. I think we have to have, we have to think biblically about God. Yeah. Yeah. We have to think in line with Jesus and the New Testament and God as Father and Son and Spirit and this intermingling of delight. God as the most joyful mm. being in the universe. Like, who would not want to be around that? I'm just thinking of like my most joyful friends, yeah. like a short list of people that are just really joyful. Yeah. I always want to be with them. Mm-hmm. Like Al, if you're listening, do you want to hang with Al? Yes, I want to hang with Al tonight because he's just <laughs> so joyful. You know, like we're just drawn, all of us, as I can say this as a, as a melancholy personality type, we're drawn to joyful people. Mm. Yeah. So we have to realize that God is joyful if our hearts are going to desire to be with him. And I, think, people for I think placing it, placing the reordering of his desire for us, because I think a lot of people come in thinking God wants our obedience more than our joy, as opposed to seeing- Well, they think of those as two separate things. As opposed to seeing the father saying, no, I, it's, like a, it's like me. It's like me as a father. Like there are times when I just want compliance <laughs> out of my own weakness, <laughs> but genuinely I want the joy of my children. I yes. want them. And I know that when I'm helping them make decisions wisely, their joy is is abounding. Yes, obedience is the path to joy. That's the thing. Now you're, think, you're imperfect. So when you're on your game. Yeah, um, but no, I think that's exactly it. I think we have to relearn that. You know that that God. But even stating that that's a that's a goal. That's His intention. That's His heart for us as Father. Is yeah, God is, is a joyful freeing. God who's yeah. after. Yeah, I mean that was Jesus said that explicitly. Yeah. He prayed that we that His disciples would be full of joy. You know? Yeah. Can I add one more thing here? Yeah. Just because I think it's important. I think we can hear a lot of what you're saying, or I can even, and go like, yeah, this is great. This is true about God, but it doesn't feel true. So I just want to say, especially because I think my experience on the Sabbath sometimes is like, even though I've got years of like deprogramming and reprogramming (laughs) and discipline of like thought of who God really is, I, I think it's okay to come to Sabbath a little bit like a child sometimes to say like, would you show me? in an experiential way who you are. So yeah. I just, yes. I know that, I, I don't know who that's for. I just have a, just a sense that yeah. like, it's important to say, it's okay to say to God, I've only perceived you this way, yeah. but would you show me who you are in the joyful sense? Yeah. Will you show me what it means that you are a joyful God 
And will you show me how to be, yeah. which is what we're saying, mm-hmm. is like existing within that Trinitarian love. Yeah. Like, how can I be here and experience that reality with you? And I think it's just, I just think it's important for us to say, like, it's okay That's to great. ask God for yeah. that. Ask God oh, to teach so you. To teach you that. Yeah. And to show you that. To and reprogram he, in he a sense. He can come to you. He can come and reveal himself that way yeah. to you. And, and we just, of, we need that sometimes. One of the, what you're, what you're defining is something that for me has been such a, a helpful thing in my whole, you know, relationship with God and my whole experience of Sabbath and the experience of the practices is that I naturally by my attachment, by my family system will approach God through a very particular set of lenses that yeah. I anticipate and define what I view of God, myself and others. Will he be there to respond or not? Is he a safe place to go to or is he a, right. a fearful place to avoid? And one of the things that's been helpful is creating new memories consistently. That's yes. the space that Sabbath allows is actually mm. to redefine every week yes. what might be what the world and what your experience and your memories and yep. your you know your family of origin. Lens. You yeah. have this whole opportunity to one day a week actually let him redefine it. Yes. Wow, and, that's really and well that, said. And I mean, imagine that that's the palace of time, right? That Heschel says you're building room after room of new memories yeah. of joy, of delight, Yeah, you know, that... Yeah, it's not always perfect. And I absolutely resonate with that so much because I come back to that place. Yes. I like that. I'm not a computer, but I like that programming, reprogramming it's idea. It's like a quilt being re, you know, kind of yeah. put back together. It's good yeah. pieces being brought together to yeah. bring comfort. You know, Brian, when you sat down with Rich Viotis for that interview, you posed a very similar question to him. Let's listen to what he said, and then we can kind of sort of riff on that a little bit. The more people I meet, I meet more people who are delight deficient in the church. Uh, than people who are feasting too much. And so I often, and it comes out in a couple of questions, whenever I talk about Sabbath or, hey, what, what brings you joy? What brings you life? I just see just a puzzled looks on people's faces. I don't know, Abraham. I'm not so oriented by work. Yeah, I try to get by or I got to work tomorrow. I, joy, what? That, I don't, there's no category for joy in my life. And so helping people to move in that direction. And then at the same time, there are important, I mean, we have Lent for a reason. In the church calendar, uh, that our lives are not oriented by our desires and driven by our uh, lusts for more, but that we are appropriately boundaried. We're not driven by our appetites anymore. Uh, and so, um, uh, I, but I think what I've discovered is we celebrate Lent and we rec- uh, we observe Lent every year as a church. Um, but at least the people in New York City, where I the people I pastor who tend to be driven by evangelical Pentecostal sensibilities um, don't often have a category for delight and joy. And so I've tried to swing the pendulum and then appropriately so, um, you know, what does it mean to be more restrictive and be more disciplined? And what, th- what does it mean to say no? And that's really at the core Sabbath is what am I saying no to? What am I saying yes to? Next thought is just that delight is how we honor our joyful God. You know, I think it is how we ascribe honor to who God is at the core of his being. Rollheiser has that simple idea that the best possible way to say thank you to anybody, God or your aunt at Christmas, is just to really enjoy the gift yeah. deeply. Yeah, that's great. You know, like as a, as a gift giver, in particular, I think of this through the lens of a parent, but it doesn't have to be that. When you give something, if somebody's really happy with it, mm-hmm. that that's the best way yep. they can honor your sacrifice. Bart, again, called joy the simplest form of gratitude. Mm. Mm. And, uh, you know, there is a thread of Gnosticism and this attempt to kind of marginalize or vacate the body or this anti-pleasure kind of strain that runs through the history of the entire church and often through some of the best streams of the church, but it is thoroughly unbiblical. Yeah. And he, you know, this anti-body, anti-pleasure. Yes. Mm. Allender in his book writes about what he calls holy sensuality. And he doesn't mean sensuality in the sense of, that's a negative word for most yeah, Christians. Mm. You know, totally. we think of like dirty sex. Yeah. He doesn't mean that <laughs> at all. Tawdry. Though he would include sexuality in sensuality. He means like your senses, mm-hmm. like eating good food yes. and watching the sunrise and lighting a candle and viewing art and, you know, storytelling and all of this. Like there's a, there's a holy, there's an unholy sensuality that we are all too familiar mm-hmm. with. But what people don't realize is that's the counterfeit. The reality is a holy 
sensuality. Mm. Yeah. So he writes about a theology of play and like holy pleasure and how the Sabbath is a day for all of that. Yeah, I think we've made Sabbath, you know, I think that's we so can good. move to the place where it's more ritualistic. And, and there are rituals to practice Rules in that based. space. But, yeah. but less fun. And I think one of the objectives I've set out really early on in practicing Sabbath was like, I needed this to be fun. And mm. it wasn't coming from a spiritual place. It was coming from a place of desperation <laughs> of like, I am working my butt off all yeah. week long. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if it's not good, I don't want to do it. So I was sort of like testing out. And probably, it's a lot of time. It's a I mean, day. Yeah. yeah. And probably like reversing that a little bit, like spiritually, probably not the best thing to do. But I was like, it's going to be fun. And then... You know, I'm going to do these other things. So that's classic, I just think, Bethany. My brain never has that thought. It's got to be fun. That's what's I, wrong with me. And what's right with you? All just, right, how do we make this fun? Give it, you know, give it life. So I just think that's like permission for us. Like if that did teach me, mm. like what you're speaking to is that, like, like when my parent gives me a gift that I love, mm. or a gift from a friend that I'm just like mesmerized by, that I can't stop enjoying. Like God delights in that. So even when I'm playing laser tag with friends, which like. That's a weird thing Shabbat to say, Shalom. but like, okay, here just, we are. I'm just a, a bit struck or dumbstruck right now. <laughs> I've just, the laser tag. I, I just thought kinda, I knew you. I kind of rediscovered it. <laughs> now I'm imagining <laughs> Bethany and I'm realizing that wasn't a joke. That no, was like real. a real I'm out of your thinking life. thinking about it for the next. IRL analogy. Yeah. Bethany playing laser tag it's, on the I'm Sabbath. I'm tough and I'm aggressive and competitive. I don't think you can shoot lasers on the Sabbath. I'm I, pretty sure that's considered. Well, whatever it is <laughs> for whoever. <laughs> I know. Now I'm feeling judged I'm and I'm feeling a little bit of shame. But I just say that just to say it's okay to prioritize fun because I yes. learned really, really early on. That, that 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 God delighted in watching me laugh and enjoy and savor the thing that he had given to me. So it's okay to embrace that That's, that fun part. But just to normalize it, you yeah. know, not just to say like laser tag could be it, you know. And the point here isn't like, hey, we need to just have more fun. Totally. I, Willard used to say that the devil's strategy is to make sin look good to mm. us. Mm and make it look like it will make us happy. So one of the best possible ways to avoid sin or temptation to sin is to discover joy. Yeah. Mm. To be happy. Yeah. So you know good. like and people that are really happy, yeah. temptation seems to be a non-issue, you know what I mean? To put it through a marriage analogy, if you're really happy in your marriage, temptation doesn't go away, but it plummets yeah. in any kind of raw power. Mm. Where if you're really unhappy in your marriage, man, it can be a daily temptation. And you could apply that to so many different facets of our life. Happy people, joyful people, full of delight, discipline and condition and feeling, they tend to be holy people, yeah. Yeah. you know? And all the most holy people I know are extraordinarily joyful, mm. you know? It's good. I think, what's the role has your line? The most joyful person you've ever met or is a saint, mm. you know? <laughs> Third thought is that we just have to watch out for counterfeit delight. Yeah, I mean, I think this one is is a zinger. Can I say that? Yeah. You know, because I think it. I think in today's day and age, it's super easy to confuse delight with what you were speaking to earlier, that kind of hedonistic right. pleasure or even entertainment, which we've spoken to, you know, on a previous podcasts. It's easy to say, like, well, what feels good? is what is good hmm. and to let that kind of be the barometer in in the ways that we define delight particularly on the sabbath um but in reality you know i think we've been saying this but delight is rooted in joy which is a, more of an internal reality produced by an encounter with god and his goodness in our life so i think you know the more we encounter true goodness yeah. the thing that our soul is actually aching for um the more we'll see what what's real and what's not yeah. you know i think i think even to the point you just made about what willard said you know um the devil's strategy is to make sin look good and i think um, and he's pretty good at and that he's yeah. very good at and even to tell us to say like this thing is what's you know is good and i think there's a real mm. work for us to do in in identifying and on the sabbath that we're, we actually become more clear on that yes. of like cuz the enemy's constantly at work in us yeah. you know and all those little subtle things well you deserve it or it's no big deal or come on you got to delight but there are actually temptations to just unholy sensuality yes. yeah. you know yeah and as we become clear clearer mm. the more you practice sabbath too I feel like life just becomes clearer. It really with does. With Sabbath. You know what I mean? It like does. it gives you a space from the noise and yeah. the programming of the wider secular culture and your own heart 
to just kind of like come back to mm -hmm. sanity, to yeah. like yeah. A, a reality based view of the world. Yeah. Mm. I was just reminded of um, that great line. Heschel has this line where he um, talks about Sabbath not being about um, frivolity or diversion, mm. um, but oh, Sabbath being about a place where we come to recollect our tattered lives. Wow. Um, and it's just this lovely vision. Um, Cause that's, that's what all that entertainment is. It's diversion. It's, you're yeah. not reintegrating. He your says yes. it dissipates life. time. Yeah. He, oh, like it's about great. dissipating time instead of like cherishing it. And that word cherishing is so important. The line that I really love is he says, labor without dignity is the cause for misery, but rest without spirit is the source of depravity. Wow. Yeah. And it is that, that's that frivolity. Like, so where, where's the balance? Part of that's the exploration we'll talk about in a minute, but I think you're right. There's this recollection of self mm -hmm. that gathered our, that image of regathering our tattered lives. Yeah. That, that is there. Yeah. Thought four is that Sabbath is a, so to kind of follow up the, we have to watch out for counterfeit delight. Mm -hmm. Thought four is that Sabbath is a weekly exploration of true delight. Keep riffing on that. Brian. Yeah, no, I absolutely think that's the exploration piece because you can't know. I mean, it's, it's a time of, this has been my experience, like laser tag is probably a newer discovery for you, yes. which I think is amazing. <laughs> um, and who knows if that might be something <laughs> in the, still can't get in the coming weeks. <laughs> it's not embarrassing. I, a, a I just love that Brian are like, you know, it's poetry and it's chilled wine and it's <laughs> That's not just like, me. I, it's laser tag. No, I go love it. recently a rediscovery. I go just, crazy karting with my kids. They have these electric carts. We go to a parking <laughs> lot by our house and we just, I mean, and I read while they're doing that, but it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, there it is. <laughs> but I, no, but I still enjoy. I mean, I I love. I mean, I'm I'm always climbing. Like I'm I'm naturally I'm like a I'm very like playful. My my wife laughs at me all the time because I'm the dad at the park after the kids get out of school who's like climbing a tree with their yeah, kids. Great. So like that side of it is like I've always had that kind of. Those are the things that I need to discover. And when we talk about exploring true true delight, it's it comes back to the idea that you may not know what really delights your soul because we're so labored yeah. under the resistances, under the architecture of work and consumerism that even that space feels like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. What do I do? Go play tennis, yeah. go fish, go golf. Like people make up these things, these hobbies, but they don't know what truly delights them. So yeah. I, I began to take a... Um, I began to take like a, a, a pros and cons of things that like I keep in my Sabbath and I don't after I try yes. them for a few Sabbaths. Good. One of the things that came to us at the beginning of the pandemic was we had our TV in the garage because we were doing this long fast and in the very beginning of the pandemic and our kids, which they watch shows, not a lot, but enough where they were like disappointed that they didn't have the TV in there in the house. And I said, well, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take post-it notes and everything that we do, instead of putting a show on, we're gonna fill the gap in our wall where the TV was. Oh, that's and great. And so, you know, we put, it basically filled this three by three or whatever a TV is. And it was like, we read this together and we played this, we went to kites. And it was just like, that is delight. Mm -hmm. And it's that wall where the TV was, that wasn't a dissipation of time or energy, but was actually this thing that discovered at the end of the day, my, my body is sore for you know maybe running hard or something, mm -hmm. but I feel truly rested somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that playful idea. Um, that idea of is something, uh, a good test of, of, of if something's delightful and beautiful is if it calluses you and deadens you. Mm. Like watch a TV show, watch eight hours of a TV show and see if you're more calloused and yeah, deadened. Yeah, you're not more rested and joyful Or you're more at the rested. End. Yeah. And even if it's harder to read a long novel, there's something more restorative in the long process. Mm -hmm. And beauty will always deepen and restore. And, and I think delight will always deepen and restore, even if it costs you energy. Yes. But this, I think this is why we put delight as the third movement, which yeah. is, you know, that's our architecture, you know, not a chapter and verse from scripture. But in my mind, there's a flow there from yeah. stop, mm -hmm. rest, delight, worship, because that is my experience of yeah. the Sabbath. Not like I block out, okay, four hours I stop. Yeah. Four, but there is a progression there. Of course, they all overlap where first I just need to stop and yeah. my body mm -hmm. goes through all the yeah. stuff. Yep. Then I need to rest. That's exactly it. Because delight will require something of you. Delight yes. is a verb. It is something yeah. you yeah. do. Yeah. And if you're too tired, I run, this is the danger of exhaustion in the spiritual life, mm. is when we are exhausted, we actually don't have the energy to do the very things mm. that will restore our soul. Mm. Yeah. 
because we're too tired. Yeah. So we turn to sin or we turn to diversion or entertainment or whatever, yeah. because that does not require anything from us mm. uh, other than just entropy, mm. you know? So this is where, you know, Richard Foster called joy the keystone of the spiritual disciplines. Mm. We need to be joyful, which is why delight is really important. And what I find on Sabbath is I have to rest for a while and then I will just find myself naturally beginning to delight. Yeah, You know what I mean? It's like at a certain, there's always a turning point and where that turning point is in the Sabbath for me <laughs> basically is a great indicator of whether or not I was in my rule of life for the week previously mm -hmm. or not, mm. yeah. you know? But if it's at a decent, there's this, this moment there is this moment where I just feel my heart shift and I'll just notice a bird or I'll just have a joyful feeling or I'll just smile at the future and I can just sense it like, okay, hmm. something just shifted in my body. Mm. I've now rested to the point I now have capacity for delight, yeah. you know? Oh, good. Fifth thought as we move on, and this is a key one, is that delight in general, but Sabbath in particular is best done in community. And this is one of the great, I think, dangers of like the millennial wellness culture mm. is we run Sabbath through our hyper individualistic grid. And we're like, yeah. yeah, Sabbath is really important. It's like a form of self-care for me. Yeah. yeah. Rather than thinking of the Sabbath as a community discipline yeah. that we do together mm. to delight in God and do justice to the poor and worship the center. You know, it is a it's best done in community. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's interesting to think about that because delight is like an overflowing image in my mind. Like it's like delight's the the sweet thing, yeah. which is what we're all going for when we're eating dinner anyway. Like my main objective when we're eating dinner is like dessert's coming. Yeah. So we got to get through this <laughs> to get to the good thing, which is kind of what we've been talking about. But that's in my mind, delight is this like extra. Yeah. It's like how I would see it's like this just there's an a little bit of an overflow of goodness. Mm. And mm. and so in that, like if like there's that. overflow, we could, to your point, indulge ourselves or we could share it. Like it could yeah. be yeah. it's it's meant it's excess that's meant to be shared together with other people. So in so many words, delight is meant to be a shared reality. Mm. Um in the scriptures, delight is connected to this imagery of bending yourself towards something mm. or towards someone. Mm. Um, I just did a little study this morning because Boom. I'm an academic, not <laughs> at all. Um, but but in my mind, it was really helpful and it's been helpful that like there's a bending in me, not just for my own gratification or my own self you know, satisfaction, but for something else. Mm. And then in that giving or in that bending, um, there's an expansion of the delight I've received. So a delight is much more, it should be much more than just a personal experience. It's one, it's an experience that's meant to be multiplied in many ways. And I think, you know, in simpler terms, um, there's just a delight you get from being with someone else or from, you know, sharing something with other people that's yes. just yeah. part of It's designed the to be done together. Yeah, like when you want to celebrate, yes. I'm like, I need to call my, you need Somebody to celebrate with else. someone. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a, I'm as introverted as they come. <laughs> But like, I don't throw celebration parties by myself, yeah. <laughs> which is actually really good to know, you know, because that would be weird. Yeah, I have I'm just to help like you. alone. Yeah. yeah. On the yes, just me <laughs> popping a popper. <laughs> and just by a yourself, party hat like, on. <laughs> champagne. I can see you in your chair. <laughs> just me. I feel yeah. like that's like a new sad Keanu. I, I'm like, so no, just you, sad, and popping a popper <laughs> by yourself. Not even me. The point is multiplication. Like delight multiplies, and it's meant to multiply. Yeah. You know. Yeah, this is really making me think of a few things that Tish Harrison Warren said about Sabbath and community and how, the tragedy of how Sunday has has lost the Sabbath quality, even mm. for modern Christians. Yeah. Now, we, even for Christians that are fastidious about church attendance, Sunday is no longer this communal day yeah. of worship and rest and justice. She Listen to what she had to say on this. Something that can be a little sad for me in our contemporary moment is that um, Sabbath rest has come to be understood so individually that it's kind of my day of rest or it could just seem like, you know, this, this like privileged luxury. Um, but this historically was deeply communal. So it was A, something the church did together, the church rested together. So it was a day where, I mean, maybe you all go home and take a nap, but then there's also like 
you gather, you have friends, you have a feast, which for introverts, like self. Yeah, which I am an introvert. Might That might sound like, oh my gosh, that's like exhausting. But I think I think we need to be around like our easy friends, like our easy family on Sundays, you know, and um, particularly during feast seasons. And this helps like introvert extroversion is really balanced well by like feast like Christmas and Easter, you know, feasting with friends. And um, and so um, there was that element that the Lord's Day was something always kept together. But then because of that, there was a justice element to this, that we don't just cease working so that we can like have a spa day. We cease working so that others can cease working, so that we don't, in the end, only see the poor other people's bodies as something to kind of serve us but but that rest is given to everyone by god and so we extend rest to everyone who we can in god and honestly like i don't even know what this means to keep this now like what what do, what does this mean when we have um <laughs> like it you know people working in chicken factory seven days a week 24 hours a day what does this mean in a globally connected world where we have you know internet server farms and that sort of thing i mean i don't know like when we have people at every moment have to be like cleaning up the dark web what what does this look like i i don't have an answer to that but i i do want to say there should be like some we need to kind of rediscover the communal element of the sabbath both with churches keeping it together other keeping the Sabbath, but also that um, there's kind of a, a always in the Old Testament the call to rest is this like radical call to treat workers with dignity, and so there's there is a justice element of of treating workers with dignity, but also like laying down our fights for a day, like in our in our cultural polarization where it's conceive that if you spend you know one second not calling people out on twitter that um you're you know tepid about justice like what does it mean for us to cease from our even political striving and actually like make room as a community to be just a human being with limitations with longings the desire to rest and to play and to then extend that same courtesy of being a human being with limitations to other people particularly those that that aren't privileged um i i don't know what that looks like but i i do feel like that's where the church needs to kind of press in on sabbath so that it's 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 not just sort of spun through just a, a, a deeply individualistic lens well lots of really great thoughts there mm. and i'm going to be thinking about that for a while Last thought before we wrap up is, you know, as we think about Sabbath and Sabbath delight, and as we think about Sabbath and delight are both best done in community, our last thought is the best way to start this, maybe that's too strong of language, but Mm. one of the best ways to start this is the Sabbath meal. For me, the kind of reorganization of the Sabbath around a community meal was like a game changer, Mm -hmm. you know? So like I started Sabbath alone uh, because kind of just the way our story played out, my wife was not into it at first. So at first it was just me and then we were both into it. And then, you know, early on we started in the morning because we're Americans. And Mm -hmm. so the day starts when you wake up. And then, you know, came into kind of biblical theology of day starting at sundown. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of wisdom tradition around you start Sabbath at night and you begin with, you know, sleep and such. So changing it at night, that was amazing. But then, and we had kind of a family meal that we'd start Mm -hmm. with. But then when we turned that family meal into like a party Mm. and we formed a a kind of a Sabbath community that we all Sabbath together at the same time, we begin together, we turn our phones off together, we do the Sabbath box together. We, We tend to end the Sabbath together too. So we'll come back together on Saturday nights for like a big, you know, dinner and a movie or something like that. That for me, which came like 10 years into my Sabbath practice, Mm -hmm. it was almost like rediscovering the joy of, it's been the best season of Sabbath Mm. I've ever had. Mm. 
I think it kind of goes back into this the meal idea goes back into this like shared experience. Yes. Like what better to share than food? Yeah. I mean, you know, not to sound no. trivial, but like it's a beautiful space. And I think, you know, I don't know, but my experiences, even last season around tables with people that I love, um, has had this really extraordinary it's just done an extraordinary work in me of reminding me um, that I'm not alone. Yeah. And it, it, I don't know how to say it except that I felt like at the table when I was with others um, and do that. I have a meal every Sabbath. Um, it's like my loneliness is absorbed and yeah. I'm reminded at some deep level of my place in mm. in their story, but in our story and in what God's doing weaving together. So the table has afforded me even a different perspective on what God's doing, mm. that if I were just having a regular me- meal during the week, it's something different. But this, I don't know, has captivated my mm. imagination and helps set a trajectory and framework for how I enter into the week yeah. ahead. Oh, that's beautiful. It's making me think. Um, I just read Andy Crouch's recent book where he writes about household. Mm. And, uh, you know, this Greco-Roman idea how homes were organized differently in the New Testament era than they are today around kind of a a single person in an apartment Mm -hmm. or a nuclear family or whatever. But it was this idea of household. And there's a biblical theology. Some of that is just that was Greco-Roman culture and the New Testament occurs at the same time. But there is this biblical theology of like kin is the language we Mm -hmm. used where you Mm -hmm. blur the lines between biological family and brother and sister in Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of this, you know, through line of biological family and honor your parents and children and spouses. But then there's also this impetus to create family and to create kin. So for those like myself or you, Brian, who have a kind of more traditional family structure, then there's a responsibility on us to open up. I think there's a biblical responsibility on us to create family for people that don't Mm -hmm. and for single people to move toward families. And there's so much that a family can give to a single person and a single person can give to a family. Yeah. And, you know, and, and to create communities of justice, community of Sabbath rest. So I think there is a biblical concept there of kinship, of household, of beginning to form communities around tables that Sabbath together. Mm. We live this tremendously compressed, constrained kind of family life. But the ancient world had this thing, and the Greco-Roman world in particular, called households, which were actually not just intergenerational family. The household idea emerges in more complex societies where you end up with a a nucleation around a a mother-father pair, the pater familias in the Roman world. And it's a patriarchal world, and I'm not saying we adopt all this for us, nor did the early Christians adopt all of its features. But just thinking about how it worked culturally, you've got the, the father, the mother, the children, and maybe some older relatives in the house. But then you have uh, actually what we would now call economic relationships, which is a word that comes from household. Oikonomia is the the rule of the household, the oikos. We get economics from household because the economic life of the ancient world happened through these relational networks that were that we are also based in this thing we call patronage and uh, allowed people to be connected to one another in very thick ways, sometimes literally living under the roof of a pater familias. And And so a whole group of people, some related biologically, others related economically, all these people are part of the household. Now, to just jump to our moment, what I, in this book, am exploring, and and my wife and I are actually literally living right now, which we could talk about, is what if we started to rebuild these bigger than family household settings? And by that, I primarily mean, though not exclusively, literally under one roof, where other people have the keys to your door because um, for uh, intimacy, for trust, for marital relationships to happen in all, all their dimensions, there is a kind of uh, interiority that's needed for the family, for the parent-child relationship. So I'm not at all saying commune, but, but I do think there's, there's a way in which I think uh, an index of relational health in your life is how many people have the keys to your house and the freedom with appropriate boundaries, of course, but the freedom to come and go. And and another way to put it is, who knows? Who would who would know if you died in the middle of the night? First of all, maybe your kids would know now, but your kids are going to grow up and leave the home. This is part of human development. They grow and they leave. They form families on their own. Maybe you have a spouse, but more than half of American adults do not have a spouse. 
And there's all kinds of reasons why they don't, and not everyone is going to marry. And Jesus himself said not all, all of his followers would marry. So who's going to know you well enough that if you don't awake in the morning, they're going to check on you? That when you fall asleep, they move a little more quietly because they know you're asleep. That's the most elemental level of being known. That in the rhythms of my days, there's someone else who is present enough to me that they are aware that I am and that if something is wrong, they pick up on it, including things that I would rather they not know are wrong because I need to be known like that. Our best meal of the week is, is our Friday night meal. It's the one we probably spend yeah. our most on. It's some of, we actually started changing the way we budget so that we could accommodate mm -hmm. for hosting people <laughs> yeah. weekly around it because it's not cheap. We've yeah. talked about this, you know? Yeah. And I remember the moment, um, actually I, I kind of felt a conviction about it where my, my daughter, Evie, she started only equating the Sabbath meal with the word Sabbath. She was, is tonight Sabbath? And she just thought of it yeah, as just the meal, and I was the like, party, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing enough on the next day to like <laughs> help create a boundary for you. But I also felt this love of it because the ritual of it for her of setting the plates mm -hmm. and um, and playing out the table mat and knowing who's there. The preparation. The preparation for her, because my kids are so, they're very extroverted. They love being with people. Yeah, same with my kids. And they so for them, it. it's this invitation into like, Sabbath, whoever we have Sabbath with, their family for the night, you know? And sometimes mm -hmm. we do it ongoing with them. And sometimes it's a one-off or it might be, you know, a couple times a year because of our rhythm. And I have just loved to watch how um, our family gets wrapped up into this mm -hmm. and how it's actually begun, uh, the way that we delight and the way that we welcome people into that has begun to actually shift our community. Some of our closest friends started Sabbathing, um, started keeping Sabbath after the first time they had Sabbath meal with yes. us. Because they're like, I just want this ritual yeah. as a marker for week in my life. Yeah. And I just thought that was such a thoughtful um, way of just, okay, this is how I'm going to invite people mm -hmm. into a different, this is this is a missional, even for people who follow Jesus, a missional way of inviting people into deeper intimacy and conversation and the savoring of the meal. Mm -hmm. It actually for us emerged out of this thing called three meal days, which was something we did when before we had kids, when we lived in Northern Ireland. We, had a, we lived in a house with multiple people and we would do these things on our day off, we didn't call it Sabbath then, where we just do three meal days, where we'd invite these neighboring people from, I mean, we called our house the embassy because we were Americans, there was Northern Irish mm -hmm. people across from us were German and Dutch. And we would spend one day together where we would do all three meals together. <laughs> and the way it structured our whole day of just the slow in All the introverts are like, yeah, yeah. I know <laughs> breathe it. deeply, but breathe we, deeply. We made room for that. And all the <laughs> extroverts just, are like, yeah, yeah but, let's go. But when you organize your day around those things, yeah. there's something yeah. that yeah. actually forced, and you know, that would be too hard to do now fully, but there's something I learned in that season. My friend Daniel created that three meal day. And I so cherish that. I challenge people all the time. Well, just try to schedule it. See what it looks like to spend one Start day. Start with one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. Start with one. Start with one really beautiful. One. I read this book by a social psychologist a few years ago. Again, secular thing, not about this, but where he did all the research at where are most people the happiest. Mm. And he found that the highest levels of happiness are when mm -hmm. people are eating meals together around a table. Yeah. Mm. What I love about this is it's so simple. Yeah. yeah. Anybody can do this. Yeah. Y yeah. Yes, there's like an expensive high-end version where you have like the kinfolk table and the expensive <laughs> wine and all the things, you know? But you don't need to be rich to do this. Yeah. You no. don't need to have some gorgeous home. This is, you know, the tragedy of people confusing a biblical theology of hospitality with with entertainment. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Which is more of like showing off than welcoming people yeah. in. But yeah. I mean, Jesus was hospitable and he didn't even own a home, yeah. you know, but everywhere he went, he was the host, yeah. welcoming people to his table. Mm. And so I think this is so simple. Anybody can do this yes. yeah. on almost any budget. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can host a meal, yeah. you can create family, you can create a Sabbath. And I still think this is the best you know, response to the injustice that many of us feel that is often exacerbated by Sabbath. I mean, yeah. Sabbath was intended as an act of justice. It was yeah. this idea, Sabbath is never just for you. It was always for, from the Sabbath command on, yeah. it was for, you know, in, in the 10 commandments, you're a servant and you're animals, but it was always <sighs> intended for others. It was like, how yeah. do you, how do yes. create yeah. a cultural architecture of justice yeah. where all people have access to delight yeah. and to rest? And again, you know, we think of 
uh, justice as this as an angry thing we do. It's hard for us to equate justice with delight. Yeah. yeah. This idea of creating a community of justice yeah. in a positive sense. So Sabbath is like we're not going to change the systemic injustice of America or Western civilization. But you know what? We can invite some people for dinner. Yeah. yeah. And we can create Sabbath for people that don't have it. And we mm. can open Sabbath communities, you know? Mm. That's what I love about it. It's just so, it's such a doable thing. And that is, I think as we draw this to a close, that is likely the best place for you to start. Again, yeah. for those of you that are new to Sabbath or just starting the practice, you know, there's a whole line, start where you are, not where you should be. Many of you are not ready yet to like dive into a full 24 hour thing with <laughs> fixed hour prayer and all of the things. Laser tag. Yeah. La yes. And laser tag and laser after tag. fixed hour yeah. prayer or right. maybe before. I don't know. We are free <laughs> in Christ as the saying goes. <laughs> but most of you can start mm. with a meal. Yes. On a Friday night or a Saturday night or after church on Sunday, you can get a mm -hmm. few friends together or your family and uh, and you can do this. Those of you running the practice, this is the exercise for week three. Yeah. Throw a party, eat a meal, do it together with your community. So we have a lot more to say next week in our final episode on worship. But to end, uh, Brian is a writer of poetry, mm -hmm. in case you don't know. And he will occasionally text me a poem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am a reader of poetry, not a writer of it. But uh, we thought it would be fitting to end with a poem on Sabbath and delight. Draw me to the hearth of inner love, towards close fires and healing meals, like the frosted months gather life and balm the soul. Indulge me in the longing of taffy-stretched conversation, too sweet, too long, and altogether too delightful. Put past the mere bread of daily need and savor this banquet of joy and pleasure. Rejoice with me in feasting fellowship, riding the highs of bellowed laughter, and bear with me the stomach rising fall that dips near despair. Keep pace, in step and in time to notice the coloring of leaves and stiffening branches. Let us be bored to depth, each gravity-laden foot sinking deeper to life without fear or worry, but with rest. Help me to know at the beginning what we'll have at the end, a friend. Friendship is the victory, born from it, moved by it, and lost in it. Let me savor at the beginning what we'll know in the end. God is friendship. <laughs>